I thought this was a brilliant observation by someone on Twitter who wrote, Trump puts out so many bizarre statements on Christmas Day each year. The ones below are just a fraction. Why on Christmas does Trump send these messages? Because his cult was worshiping another. So he had to pull their attention back away from Jesus Christ and remind them that it's always about him. He couldn't stand not being the focal point even for one day. Quote, why is everyone happy and celebrating when the election was stolen and your favorite president is being persecuted by the sick thugs and world leaders? How could anyone have a great day of celebrating the birth of Christ when this is happening? Madness and doom may my enemies rot in hell. Look at me, not Jesus. It's the statements from Donald Trump. And at the end of the day, Donald Trump wields religion as a way to try to act holier than thou. This is someone who was found liable for rape in a civil case in New York. This is someone who we've heard on audio recordings bragging about sexually abusing women. This is someone who has lived a deranged, depraved lifestyle. Yet, I am sick and tired, and I hope you feel the same way, of at all of these traveling fascist circus events that Donald Trump calls rallies where someone saying that they're a pastor but who doesn't deserve that title at all goes up there and gives these horrendous and horrific speeches and says that, oh, it's Donald Trump who speaks the word of God and Donald Trump this and he's going to be your retribution. Let me give you two examples, but then what I'm excited to share with you is finally a pastor who is out there who is saying that what Donald Trump and this MAGA movement represents is nothing to do with any of the values of any religion, frankly. And here in the United States of America, by the way, we have a separation of church and state. And President Biden is someone who actually is devout, who is very religious, but he doesn't put it in our face. He respects and recognizes the separation of church and state, whereas this whole MAGA crew wields it and bludgeons us with it to try to act holier than thou when they engage in deplorable behavior. Here's one example example of a pastor's opening remarks at one of these Trump events in Iowa. Play the clip. We pray that you will impart wisdom to our president as he goes forth to stand in our place. We ask that those who stand against him would be put to silence, that those horrendous actions against him and his family would be exposed and struck down. When we leave this place, give us the courage to say no to evil. Give us the victory over addictions and vices that harm us and our families. And give us the courage to stand with President Trump in the caucuses and in the election to come. We ask for your guidance, wisdom, and power in Jesus' almighty and all-powerful name. Amen. And here's another example of a pastor at a Trump event at another rally in Iowa. Play this clip. It's another pastor. Play this clip. We must not lose sight that this election is part of a spiritual battle. There are demonic forces at play. But I want to remind those who have fallen prey to the leadership of such demons, have fallen prey to the diabolic forces, and have become pawns to their schemes. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 4. This is the warning. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves, and judgment is coming. And when Donald Trump Trump becomes the 47th president of the United States, there will be retribution against all those who have promoted evil in this country. And now, without further ado, I want to share with you this incredible interview by Politics Girl with a pastor who says, enough is enough. We need to bring our country together. And I think this needs to be highlighted. So without further ado, I want to show you this interview between Politics Girl, one of my favorite shows on the network, and John Pavlovitz. 
Let's play it. It's not just, hey, these are hateful people because I've seen the beauty in them. I've seen the, the goodness in them, but it's been directed toward me, someone they know and love. And I always want to think about the people who are not present at the table as I engage. And welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Since yesterday was Christmas, I thought it was only fitting to have a conversation with someone for whom Christianity is not only the basis of his career, but also the fundamental question of his life. I want to talk a little about the religion itself, but I also thought that we should touch on what people call the reason for the season, which used to be kindness, love, and hope, and now might feel like something different. I don't think you have to be Christian to consider the idea of someone whose purpose was to devote themselves to the betterment of man as a noble project. You don't have to believe in Jesus to understand that what he stood for, or at least what he used to stand for before Christian nationalists started getting so loud, was actually pretty aspirational. To have this conversation with me today is John Pavlovitz. John is a writer, a pastor, and an activist. Not only is he a thought leader publishing best-selling books like A Bigger Table, If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk, and his newest, Worth Fighting For, Finding Courage and Compassion When Cruelty is Trending, his blog, The Stuff That Needs to Be Said, and his new substack, The Beautiful Mess, have found their way to an incredibly diverse and worldwide audience with hundreds of millions of views. A 25-year veteran of church ministries, John is the kind of unicorn in today's Christian community, seeing that he has a deep commitment to equality and diversity and justice inside and outside of his faith. John is one of those people who reminds you that there is still good in the world, and at a time where cruelty has become popular, leading with love really does seem brave. John is one of those people who truly inspires the kind of courage we're going to need if we're going to come together and fix what's broken. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, author, pastor, and gifted storyteller, John Pavlovitz. Welcome back, John. It is so good to see you, my friend. Thank you for having me back. Really great to be with you. Oh, thank you for coming. I just love you. I love your perspective. I love your writing. I love your new Substack. Thank you for joining me this holiday season. Oh, it's an honor. Now, you know I think about my faith or what used to be my faith a lot these days. So if you don't mind, I'd like to take a little journey down that road so people know where I'm coming from when I talk about religion or faith. Would you mind me doing that? That would be fantastic. I'd love to learn as well. So that's great. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that that candor because the thing is, is I was born and raised in the church, right? And And now I would say I'm definitely agnostic. And I think... The way I got there is a story that many people probably can find common ground with. So I started going to church every Sunday when I was a baby. Like our church had a nursery school that took infants and I grew up in the nursery at our church and I loved it there. The people were kind and it was a safe place. And they always gave us these really plain biscuits, which I enjoyed deeply and still remember to this day. Yes. Um, then I did all of my elementary school years in Sunday school. You know, the classes were separated by age. We all had our own room. We did the children's chapel. We joined our parents in the beautiful main church on Christmas and Easter. Mm. And looking back, I think our church, which was very traditional, must have also been quite open-minded because one of my most distinct memories is all the children being called up to the altar on Christmas morning to sit on the stairs. And the minister always encouraged us to bring a present or something we'd gotten on Christmas morning. And then he would talk to us about the spirit of giving and he'd talk to us about Santa. And it was this great mix between the secular and the religious. And it always made me feel very deeply connected to my church and seen and accepted and good and worthy. And no one told me like not to believe in Santa or that wasn't, you know, the reason. When I was old enough, I joined the junior choir. I loved that. I was confirmed. I did the plays. I did the youth group. And I don't remember any of it ever being heavy handed. No one talked to me about God judging me or my actions or my thoughts. And looking back on that church now with my adult eyes, I think I can see that it would be fair to say it was a very white congregation. But I don't remember anyone ever telling me or implying that those who didn't believe what we believed or didn't look how we looked were in any way bad or wrong. I never learned bigotry or racism from church. I never felt shame around God. I, I also never felt pride in my religion either. It wasn't something I defined myself by. It was just simply our community, what we did on Sundays before getting donuts, which also was part of our sure. Sunday ritual. Uh, and it, 
<laughs> and it kind of formed the basis for how I lived my life, this kind of moral basis. So between my parents and my church, it made me feel kind of loved and protected. And it taught me how to treat people and how I wanted to be treated yeah. and just to generally be a good person and to be good to others. Right. Mm. And I feel like that's what church is supposed to be in many ways. And, and I, I did that every Sunday until I was confirmed at 13. And then we just stopped going. And in hindsight, that was probably a combination of many factors. You know, my parents mm. feeling like they kind of done their duty. They gave me their religious background, my social yeah. life becoming increasingly busy as a teenager and not wanting to get up on Sunday mornings anymore. The adults in our, my parents' community sort of moving and the social group changing at church. Yeah. And I will say it never seemed weird that we stopped going. It was just sort of the next phase. I still felt Christian. I still believed in God. Mm -hmm. We still went to church on the holidays. I prayed when I thought of it. But that doing it every weekend thing, part of my life was over. It was kind of like school. Like you've done, yeah. you've completed school and you take what you learn in school and you take it into your life and you move forward. Like the next phase comes. And mostly I used to think Christianity helped me with literature and art history, right? Like I was, I was like, oh, I'm glad I know the David and Goliath story. I'm glad I know what they mean when they say I have a needle. Like that was very helpful to me as a general person. And I, I found my way back to church when I met my husband in my mid twenties. Mm -hmm. We were both feeling a little lost when we started dating. The world was weird. We didn't know exactly who we wanted to be. And since we'd both grown up Christian, we thought we'd try going back to church. And the church we chose was great. Again, it gave us community, it gave us structure. We did classes like Alpha and Beta to kind of dig deeper into our beliefs and have this safe place to ask hard questions about things we believed in, things we might not believe in. Yeah. And again, I ended up at a pretty open-minded church, right? It was one that performed gay marriage marriages, had a female minister, and we really liked it until we didn't, until stuff started to change. And this previously undemanding, hopeful, open environment started to take more of our time and ask more of us and ask more of our money. And at the time, we had very little time or money. So it started to feel a little bit oppressive, like they wanted more from us than we were able to give. Yeah. And we let ourselves drift away and we kind of never went back. And over the years, we haven't really connected with the faith. I, If anything, as years go by, I would say our family feels more and more removed from it. My immediate family, because our extended yeah. family is quite religious, I would say. Mm. Um, I still pray to God. Uh, but if I'm being entirely honest, I'm not exactly sure who I'm praying for. When I was a little kid, I definitely pictured that man in the clouds, you know, with the beard sure. and the whole thing. And now I'm not even sure... What I'm praying to, I feel like there is something bigger than us, that we aren't alone in the universe, but I'm just not sure if it's nature or energy or some amalgam of every world religion. I don't know. What I do know is that religion has caused more death and destruction than any other one thing in the history of the world. And people use religion as an excuse for their hate and for their bigotry and American Christianity in particular has become practically unrecognizable to me as if being an American Christian means that you have to control and judge others and use your religion to make laws that only serve yourself. And I want nothing to do with that. I right. keep my faith, whatever that is, but I want nothing to do with religion. And I don't want religion to have anything to do with me. In fact, I find myself incredibly prickly when people tell me what God wants or God says, or they make decisions based on God. Yeah. Does that resonate with you? Because I realize that this is an incredibly long-winded way of saying that I think Christianity has been co-opted by those who would use people's goodness and their faith and quite frankly, their fear to control and bully others. And it doesn't matter if you were literally raised in the church like I was, I don't feel like American Christianity really fits anymore with my morality or who I want to be as a person. Wow. I mean, there's just so much good stuff there. And what you're sharing is so similar to what millions of people have shared with me, either personally or through comments on the blog or just through reading the work. So many people have this uh, this experience, this formative experience of spirituality, of religion, and sometimes it was pleasant, sometimes it wasn't. But either way, what they found is that they have outgrown that faith tradition for a number of reasons. And sometimes, like you said, there are seasons of life and attendance at a church is kind of like a relationship for many of them. They're not in our lives permanently. Those are just part of a particular season. And it's particularly difficult 
as we grow older and we embrace our beliefs and we, we become more cognizant of our personal convictions, and then we try to fit them into a system that doesn't allow them any longer. And it's more and more difficult to find our place in organized religion. So your experience is so similar to so many people's, mine included, that I have this muscle memory of religion and some of it's good and some of it isn't. And what I've been trying to do for most of my adult life is find a way to express my personal spirituality in a community that allows so many of the things that you experienced as the best of faith. So the best of faith should help us feel received and seen and want the most authentic version of who we are. And so many people don't experience that in organized religion. And our faith at its best should be a place where we are constantly being propelled to welcome others and to love people who are different and to help the vulnerable. And that more and more is not the experience of American Christianity. And we need to name that. And it's whether you're a person of faith or not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we just had Christmas, right? And it got me thinking about a question that you posed in your writing earlier this year. You said, have you ever noticed that nearly all Republican politicians claim to be Christians, but never mention Jesus or his teachings? Mm -hmm. That they repeatedly reference God and the Bible and talk about faith and their as their guiding principle in their life, but they continually exclude Christ, who is obviously the namesake of their religion. And you've said that that's not an oversight. That's a necessity for them, that Christ... Jesus, Jesus, the basis of the religion, just doesn't fit into what they're trying to do. Can you expand on that a little bit for us? Certainly. There's only so much you can do to to take values that are antithetical to Jesus' teachings. And it's hard to, to take the words and the teachings of Jesus and use them in any real way because they immediately confront a lot of the things that you're seeing out of the conservative American evangelical church and the associated political movement. So what they will do is commandeer the idea of God and religiosity, and they'll use terms like the Bible, or they will use a generic term like God because they can superimpose their morality on that. But they really can't twist the words of Jesus. They can't gaslight us with the Sermon on the Mount, with love your neighbor as yourself and blessed are the peacemakers and be cares of the least of these and all of that. And so uh, Republicans and conservative Christians are really clever because they can still touch those places in people that feel religious or spiritual longings, but they can do it without being inconvenienced by the actual life and teachings of Jesus in whose name they claim all of this belief. And so that's constantly what I'm doing is trying to take those teachings, which, by the way, resonate with religious and non-religious people. Most people, they're really good with forgiveness and generosity and kindness and, and inclusion. And so what I'm trying to do is hold those words up and those teachings up as a mirror to evangelical Christianity, as a mirror to conservative politics and say, is there any commonality here? And there simply isn't. This is a movement that is bereft of compassion. And so now we have this religion that is really a uh, community of cruelty. And that's what grieves me. A uh, community of cruelty is a good way to put it. I mean, you've said over the past few decades, the people who call themselves Christians have become experts in slapping a shiny veneer of religion onto the most horrible ideas and sociopathic behaviors. I mean, you point out it's relatively easy to weaponize a generic version of God, right? To use a random or obscure scripture passage to justify your phobias or your hangups or to create a new law to combat those things. Yep. Um, but these are the people that cherry pick the Bible to conflate Christianity and America into what you've called beautifully, I think, a grotesque Frankenstein of violent nationalism that they're actually trafficking in. And to kind of create this army of devoted disciples willing to suspend their dis disbelief to justify their hatred. I think that's kind of what's happening here. Republicans use all these mental gymnastics and this pseudo piety when they're the ones 
out here having, you know, threesomes and groping each other in public theaters and getting divorced for the third and fourth time. This is the party that is literally protecting rapists and child predators while they're calling the LGBTQ community groomers and predators. I mean, the hypocrisy is staggering. And I think it just drives people even further from faith in the church because they're like, if that's what it stands for, then that's not what I stand for. Absolutely. And and when you see a group of people, politicians and religious leaders who leverage fear continually, and I often share that uh, no one is at their best when they're terrified. And yeah. when you raise people in a culture of religion that says, see what the, the conservative evangelical Christian movement, it requires an adversary. It needs an encroaching enemy to leverage in that sort of battle posture because that keeps people feeling that they're under threat. And the constant pressing in of that is, is politicians and religious leaders saying, you're right to be terrified and we can help you um, with all of these things that you're afraid of. And so you get the demonizing of immigrants and of LGBTQ people and of people who come from different countries. And over and over again, it's this constant needing of an enemy. And the best of religion really says, I, I know that the world is one interdependent community and that we are all better when we all do better and we want to lift the you know the um, experience that people have of life and community and family. We want the best for everyone, and that's just not what you see. What you see is competition rather than collaboration, and you see a sort of scarcity mindset that jobs or money or resources I need to keep those. Where a real heart of faith says, if we're generous enough and creative enough. There is always enough for everyone. And that's the place that I, I come from and so many people who read my writing or who resonate with the things that you talk about, whether they're people of faith or not. Again, it's the, that impulse to, to realize that other people, that life is really difficult and we should be trying to make life less difficult, not more difficult, which is so often what the church seems to be doing. Yeah. And it's probably what you were thinking of when you wrote your book about building a longer table, this concept that if you have too much, you don't build a higher wall, you build a longer table to include more people. I mean, you pointed out the Sermon on the Mount, right? Which is Jesus's central thesis. Yeah. Love thy enemies, forgive others, care for the poor, care for the marginalized. All of that is just completely antithetical to the current Republican position. In fact, Christ and the Christian right are actually completely oppositional movements when you think about it, because Jesus himself was all about empathy. And like you said, working together, including everyone. And right when Christianity has become all about fear and cruelty, and they're wholly dependent on excluding people, not including mm. people. I mean, the GOP openly hate the poor. That is the opposite of Christ-like, right. right? Jesus was feeding the masses, right? The GOP openly and vocally vote to take lunch away from children, <laughs> poor mm -hmm. children, right? Yeah. Jesus was all about helping the sick and the suffering. The GOP are actively running on denying people basic health care. Their long-term plan to reverse the Affordable Care Act with no alternative will only make the sick suffer more. And to be clear, Jesus would not be on board for that, right? Like all the embrace the stranger, help your fellow man, do unto others, good Samaritan, laying hands on the leper, friends with prostitutes, kindness, compassion, love, all those things I learned in Sunday school, none of that fits into Republican Christianity, which as you point out so well, has become fundamentally, don't tread on me, America first, conform or be bullied by us. Right. And when you're when you're in that environment for so long, when that becomes normalized, you aren't even able to see that. And that's what the story is for me, for so many people. There are plenty of people professing to be Christian who simply want to use that as a mechanism by which they can justify their bigotry, their discrimination, their selfishness. But many people have simply been, since we were children, you know, brought up in this culture that they hear that enough times and it becomes normal and they can't even see outside of it. And so constantly my responsibility, I feel, as a minister is to keep nudging people and placing the life and teachings of Jesus in front of them and allow those teachings to do what they can, what only they can do. So they're threatened not by my um, stance on religion or my opposition to them. They're really taken aback by being confronted 
by the actual heart of their faith tradition, uh, which is the ironic thing. And so many people, you said, you know, you consider yourself kind of some sort of agnostic. And uh, I feel like we're all, if we're honest, we're all agnostics with suspicions. You know, we, none of us really know. And I, you know, I've gone through and led church retreats and I've preached for you know, dozens of years and gone to seminary and, you know, Brendan prayer meetings on and on and on. And yet I'm cognizant of the fact that I don't know any more than any other person. And it's that I think what you explained in your opening was this, this humility that says, Hey, this is such a vast and massive idea that I don't quite understand all of it. And it's being able to be free to question and to doubt and to wrestle. And so that's another thing. What the Christian conservative community is built on is being certain and being certain of who's in and out and, and all of those things. And that's just such an insidious, unchrist-like thing. Jesus was about the questions and the he had that rabbinic tradition of, I'm going to ask you something, or here's a word picture, here's a parable, and let's step into this story and let's have a, have a dialogue about it. Um, I've been invited by groups you know, doing this work now for a couple decades, been invited by, you know, synagogues and mosques and humanist conferences and uh, atheist gatherings, but I've never been invited by a conservative Christian church to talk like this because they're so threatened by difference or, uh, you know, a little bit of an oppositional idea. And that's the frightening thing. It's about controlling the people they have with those things of fear that we talked about. So it's pretty sad. I mean, we're both kind of lifelong Christians, but I think we both feel like it's hard to align with people who claim their faith in Jesus' name, but kind of have no interest in being inconvenienced by what he stood for, right? These kind of self- proclaimed evangelicals actually have very little compassion for anyone who isn't white or Republican or think the same way as them. These are the same people who are cheering Texas putting up razor wire across a river to kill people who dared to come into their land when they're celebrating yesterday, you know, they're celebrating a child who went into a different land and had to be born in a barn. You know what I mean? Like that's what the faith is supposed to be about. I mean, to quote your own words back to you, there's literally nothing in the totality of Jesus' words in the New Testament that does anything but convict and condemn the Republican Party Mm -hmm. in both philosophy and practice, and they know it. So they don't ever mention Jesus anymore because then they would be forced to admit that they have no interest in his compassionate, benevolent, open-hearted message. So I think you put it really well that the next time you hear a conservative politician or evangelical preacher sermonizing about God or claiming to speak or govern on behalf of Christianity, we should confront them and speak to them and probably infuriate them by bringing up Jesus himself. (laughs) Right. And because, you know, there's the story of of Jesus in the New Testament is, you know, Jesus is is a street preacher. He's a person of the the low, and he's walking through the world, and he's gathering people and saying, "Here's a vision of what the world could look like." And he's not there starting a religion. There is just a group of people assembling around these ideas of uh, universal acceptance and generosity and selflessness, and that's the thing that started to grow the movement. And so it would be unrecognizable to the conservative Christian church today in America. In fact, they would be hostile towards someone who was born where Jesus was born, who looked like he looked, who was teaching the things he taught. And you're, you're right, there's you know a story in the New Testament where Jesus is in danger of being murdered in a genocide. And so he and his family flee to Egypt. And so they are refugees from this violence. And I shudder to think what it would have been like if conservative Christians in America right now were there in Egypt because Jesus would have never made it in or he would have been sent back. And I tell people, you'd have a very different New Testament. It would have been a lot shorter. And that... (laughs) And that's the thing, you know, the irony is people who aren't Christian or aren't religious are often the people who embrace all of these things the most, which is exactly what happened with Jesus. He says to the religious leaders, hey, the the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the sinners, they're entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. In other words, they get it. And you religious people, you power holders are perverting and missing the message. And we're, you know, history is repeating. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, King of Kings, he was not a king at all. He was a regular guy uh, yeah. talking to regular people. I mean, I think since we're in this holiday season, I think the thing is, is that these kind of conflicts that come up, the holidays become tough for a lot of people, right? Because it's typically a time of family and friends. We send cards to people. We spend time with people we don't necessarily see all that often. And it's a time that's supposed to be in good spirit and good faith. And then there's a lot of us who feel deeply separated from our friends and family these days because of what we've been through and still continue to go through politically and as a country. Mm. So the holidays become tense for a good number of us. And I, I know you've put a lot of thought into the idea of people severing relationships because of politics. And I, I use the term politics, you know, with air quotes, because yeah. I don't think it's politics that actually divides us. I think it's morality. But will you talk to us a bit about this phenomenon, about the rift that's come between so many of us in the past 10 years when it comes to the way that we look at the world? So this is the holiday season, and I'm sure if you're like me, you spent too much money this past couple of months and you want to tighten your belt a bit. Well, one of the simplest ways to do that is to cancel subscriptions you're paying for that you forgot about with Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills all in one place. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel subscriptions you don't want with just the press of a button. No more long wait times or annoying emails with customer service. Rocket Money does the work for you. Did you know that 80% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about? It's just too easy these days to subscribe to something and then completely forget you did it. And then these monthly charges keep rolling in and you're paying without even knowing. Most people think they're paying $80 a month for subscriptions when they're actually paying closer to 200. And sometimes, even when you do know what subscriptions you're paying for, you don't realize that the prices went up. Rocket Money can alert you to price increases or even negotiate that price for you. So join the over 5 million users and counting who are letting Rocket Money save them on average $720 a year. In fact, Rocket Money has a billion dollars in total savings so far. So stop wasting money on the things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash politics girl. That's R-O-C-K-E-T-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash politics girl. Rocketmoney.com slash politics girl. So winter is here. And for many people, that means struggling to find the right temperature when you sleep. Did you know that your temperature at night has one of the greatest impacts on the quality of your sleep? If you're always waking up too hot or too cold, then I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics to make temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Miracle Made silver infused sheets are not only thermoregulating, but also prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. Plus, they're just really nice, deliciously high quality without the yucky high price. See for yourself. Go to trymiracle.com slash politics girl to try it today or do a late gift to someone this holiday season. And we've still got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% and if you use our promo code politicsgirl at checkout, you'll also get three free towels and save an extra 20%. That's a real deal. And Miracle is so confident that they've backed it with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep today with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that is trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to treat yourself or a friend or a loved one. Thank you, Miracle Made. It's been a busy season, and for some a stressful season, and for a lot of us that meant not sleeping well. Maybe you went home to your childhood bedroom, maybe you were on vacation in a hotel bed with the wrong pillow, maybe you were just a person who has trouble sleeping and staying asleep. For whatever reason, we know sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health, and not getting good quality sleep affects our performance throughout the day. If we want to feel good, then a consistent nighttime routine that offers us true rest is non-negotiable. Beam Dream is a science-backed, healthy hot cocoa for sleep. While other sleep aids can cause next day grogginess, Beam contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, melatonin, and nano-CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. The numbers don't lie. In a clinical study, 93% of participants reported Dream helped them get a better sleep. You just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, froth, and enjoy before bed. 
And today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Now available in delicious flavors like chocolate peanut butter, cinnamon cocoa, and sea salt caramel with only 15 calories and zero grams of sugar. Find out why Forbes and the New York Times are talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash politicsgirl for up to 40% off. Beam Dream, because you deserve to sleep well. So I have a super rare lung disease, and although the scarring is in my lungs, it's my heart that's actually affected. So I know firsthand how important heart health is to your body, which is why I'm so pleased to be talking about Humans Super Beat Heart Chews. Super Beat Heart Chews are an easy and convenient way to support healthy blood pressure and promote heart healthy energy. They're plant-based and stimulant-free, so you get that green boost without the jitters. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beets are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. Super Beets is the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended beet brand for cardiovascular health support, which means it's blood pressure support you can trust. If you find yourself drinking too much coffee or power drinks to keep your energy up, you can switch it up to Super Beat Heart Chews used by college athletes and pro sports teams to support performance and endurance. Double your potential with Super Beat Heart Chews. Get a free 30-day supply of Super Beat Heart Chews and 15% off your first order by going to getsuperbeats.com and using the promo code politicsgirl. That's getsuperbeats.com, code politicsgirl. Think of all you can do with one little chew. Will you talk to us a bit about this phenomenon, about the rift that's come between so many of us in the past 10 years when it comes to the way that we look at the world? Lee, I think what what you see is in the work that I do, I call myself a collector of stories, a war correspondent, and, and people share with me over and over. There's a pattern to what they share, and it shows me that the divide is not clearly just political. It's not Republican versus Democrat. It's not spiritual. It's not conservative Christian versus non-Christian or conservative Christian versus progressive. It's really a vision divide. It's a, it's how we see the world, how we see resources, how we see community. And so what this all has been between Trump's arrival and his tenure and the pandemic and all of this has been about the fracture of relationships because all these political ideas and these theological things, they're big and distant, but it's in the small and the close that this is all really hitting us. And it's in those separations. It's in the empty tables at holiday times. So we're all really trying, this all finally settles down into our families, our friendships, our coworkers, relationships, our neighborhoods. And this is a particularly difficult time to try and figure out. I think we're always going to be in tension between our moral convictions and our relationships, because there are times when those things are not easily reconciled. And then that's what you speak to. It's a group of people right now. And we have this, again, this muscle memory that says the holidays is about family. It's about being together. And yet to do that, is to either be inauthentic and not acknowledge all that we've been through, or it's to bring it all out and risk having that trauma and that um, turbulence. And for me, that's the essence of my faith. You know, people say, well, we get together, but we don't talk about politics and religion. And I say, well, that's really um, not a place I want to be. If I'm with my family and my my chosen tribe. I want to be able to talk about the deepest contents of my heart and the things that matter the most to me. So if we're choosing to, if we're having to be edited around people, we have to rethink whether or not that relationship is really healthy for us anymore. Yeah. And you've said you've come to terms with being okay with burning bridges with people you were previously close with because you couldn't continue to nurture lies and you couldn't continue to ignore hypocrisy, that you were actually intolerant of people's intolerance and you couldn't keep pretending otherwise. Because I think as you pretty validly point out, 
it does end up being us that, that feel like that, that we're going to be intolerant of people's intolerance. We can no longer take the cruelness. We can no longer ignore it or pretend we're not hearing it. Yeah. Um, and it's us. It ends up being us that's altering the connection between these people and ourselves. It's us who are basically refusing to play ball. But you've said you're okay because you're okay living with that because you have to live with yourself. And for for you, it's worth the risk. And I think for me, it's worth the risk too, that you're finding yourself at a point where you're okay burning that bridge and being separate from those people in your life because it's not that you find joy in the severing of those ties right. or even as you put so well, there's no joy in kind of a cheap high five of giving people the middle finger or burning them with some smart point mm -hmm. or some mic drop. But you do have to let go of certain people as a form of self-preservation. You do. And my heart is your heart. We, we, we love the same things that all people love, which is connection to other human beings. And so relationships matter deeply. So it's never anything that I would rejoice in, in the ending of that, but you're right. There comes a time. And, and so maybe in 2017 or 2018, I might have approached someone with a different mindset and I might have tried to find the commonalities and held out hope for reconciliation. But the longer things unfold and the more people double down on what you thought was maybe just a momentary lapse of judgment, when this turns out to be a deeply held belief that they're not willing to let go of, we do often have to make a decision. And for me, I lost people, but the, the losing of people, whether they were in my church or friendships or family members, that was the, the price, the acceptable collateral damage of speaking truth so that other people could know that they are seen and heard and loved. And so that's, that's where the faith thing is difficult. Jesus says, you know, you love God, you love your neighbor, you love your enemies, and you love the least of these. And so that's the difficult part when you're looking at the least of these, in other words, those who are most vulnerable, most invisible, most oppressed, and you're trying to love them, which is easy, but you're also trying to figure out what do I do with people, even people I know and love, who may be the oppressors. And that's a real difficult spot to be in. But as you said, uh, as I've written, you may love them. You just may have to do it at a distance. It doesn't, yeah. mean, it doesn't mean physical or relational proximity. It means acknowledging their humanity and deciding whether you have differences that are, um, you know, whether you are morally compatible or not. And so for many people, they're not in my life and I, they're not out of my life with malice. It's simply this was the result that needed to happen so that I could continue to be the most authentic version of myself and the most joyful. And that's important for all of us to realize we're not, we don't owe people permanence or proximity. We owe them honesty and authenticity and that's it. Yeah. I mean, everything I said, I learned from your writing. I learned so much from your writing. I mean, ultimately I think we can't be afraid to speak up about the things that matter to us. We have to live a full and authentic life. We have to make sure others can as well. And like you said, sometimes that's going to mean collateral damage when we find ourselves in opposition to people who don't want to live like that. Sometimes we're going to have to hold up our integrity and be okay letting go of even previously treasured relationships, right? Because they're, they just are living in opposition to how we want to live. We can't just accommodate prejudice to make things fine. Things right. aren't fine. The Republican frontrunner for president is at the vermin phase. He's calling people vermin. Yeah. They're talking about rounding up people into camps. Women's rights have already been stripped from them all around the country. Mm -hmm. The Speaker of the House thinks being gay is an abomination and should not only be outlawed, but punished by our society. Mega Republicans are openly talking about Christian nationalism and they're tied to white supremacist movements. So things are not okay. And pretending they are does damage to so many people. People. And you have written beautifully about this and about how the more people who dig their heels in with the bigotry and the xenophobia and the hate, the less you can get on board with making some sort of uneasy truce or concessions to them. Because even if the people who are saying these things or feeling these ways are people that you previously loved or people you respected or people that you're related to, at some point... We simply don't have the time anymore to make the excuses. There is too much going on. There's too much at stake. Too many people around the country are already being treated inhumanely. The planet's on fire and things are only going to get worse. So really, if we look at it 
like you said, burning a few bridges in our personal lives is actually a very little thing to do in comparison to that grand scale of what's going on in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And the the difficult part sometimes is that we look at someone and we say, well, they're, they're nice to me. They treat me. They treat my children well. And that's not the issue. So the issue is, but they, they may treat us well because I'm just another white cisgender heterosexual guy in their family, let's say. And so they're, they're being really decent to me, but I can't use that only as my barometer because I have to realize that the way that they feel about people of color or immigrants or Muslims, the way that they feel and the way that they vote is definitely predatory toward those people. And so those those people groups, those vulnerable oppressed people may not be physically present at that table that I'm present at. And so my job is to try and represent the other stories that may not get told in that setting. And then I'm across from my uncle or a grandparent or whoever that could be. And I'm having to give them uh, information that may not be welcome. And so that's part of this too. It's not just, hey, these are hateful people because I've seen the beauty in them. I've seen the the goodness in them, but it's been directed toward me, someone they know and love. And I always want to think about the people who are not present at the table as I engage. And so that's a huge part of this. Yeah. I always say we're responsible for our people. And sometimes that means having those uncomfortable conversations at your dining room table, having, you know, pushing yes. back on your dad that says the thing instead of just being like, Ugh, you know, being yeah. like, actually, dad, where'd you hear that? Because that sounds quite blah. And it might be tough. It might be a tough conversation to have. And I often say, come at it with curiosity, because that's often a better way yeah. to address things than an uh, aggressively. But if you're going to say Black Lives Matter, if you're going to advocate for migrants, if you're going to respect the Muslim community and stand against anti-Semitism or fight for freedom and the rights of the LGBT community or for women's rights to their own body, or, and if someone in your life doesn't like that, then that's a them problem. you know. That's and right. if we end up losing people from our lives because we speak up for the respect and the rights of others, then that kind of has to so be it, I think. I think that's where yeah. we kind of have to be. And as you say, you might be able to still love that person, but you might have to love them at a distance um, so yeah. that it feels safe. And and it works for family and it also works for church communities because a lot of people, they're in this place. I've, I've often said organized religion and organized crime can be very similar because when you're in the family, right, you're fiercely loved. <laughs> but the moment you, you, you deviate, then you're excluded. It's horse heads in the bed and concrete shoes, right? And so that the desire for community is so strong that people will stay in churches knowing that this is not aligned with their hearts because they don't want to lose that connection with with people so and the same thing with our families and so there's often a detribing that happens when we embrace the you know our our deepest truths and there's a retribing that has to happen we have to find people who we are going to do life with and it may not be the people we originally thought but that church component, that that community is leveraged. You know, you're one of us. You're part of the chosen and the saved. And so that sets up this desire to stay there. And so I'm always trying to make sure people know you can have differing views, but find a community that doesn't embrace you. It's not conditional community. It's not where you have to say the right things or believe the right things, which is if you're in the presence of actual love and that should be where you are, you always can exhale and be exactly who you are. And so that I insist on that. And so um, that's just how I live. Yeah, I love that. You don't want to live in a conditional community. Even if it accepts you, if you just fall in line exactly, that's not an authentic life. Like, it's what I was saying before. This isn't about religion. It's not about politics. It's, yeah. you know, people always say to me, oh, you're going to throw away a relationship because of politics. And I'm like, it has nothing to do with politics. It's about That's right. we're, we're morally incompatible. I fundamentally believe that human beings deserve respect and fair treatment under the law, no matter who they worship or who they love or how rich they are, right? I, I don't believe in book banning. I don't believe in one American religion. I'm fundamentally against basing our laws around religious doctrine. And I don't yeah. think we should be celebrating or rewarding bigots and xenophobes simply because they go to the right church or they have the right letter beside their name politically. So yeah. we have to have standards and values as a society. And if your standards and values don't match with mine, then that's, it becomes 
shaky for me. But also, if your standards and values morph with the political winds, with what you're told to believe, with what your church tells you to believe, then that's a morality problem and not a political or a religious one. And that's where I find the problem arises. Exactly. And I I think for me, I've you know, politics and, and it's just a way to label how we work out in public, what we feel in private. And so I never want to have religion intermingle, organized religion intermingle with legislation. I want a separation between church and state, but I also want the values of my personal faith to be reflected in the causes I support and the way that I vote, the candidates that I'm for. And I, I should be able to, and you should be able to do that openly. You know, it goes back to if you really are confident in what you believe, you don't necessarily need to convince everyone to agree with you. And the, you know, Jesus' whole thing was going and inviting people in to something that they were, uh, that it was engaging to them, that was encouraging to them, and they moved toward it. But it was never a position of power or might or forcing people to believe, which is what the Christian right is all about. They want dominance. They want legislative control. And that is the the biggest perversion of the message that said, come all to me who are weary and I will give you rest. I mean, they're just, you. they're not the same thing. No, not at all. Which brings me back to your writing on how not all opinions are the same thing. Not all opinions are equally valid. I mean, you've said one of the greatest lies people propagate is that all opinions are valid, that every position is somehow equally worthy of merit and deserving of consideration, both sides and all that, right? As you point out, we're often told that the most humane response when we come to an impasse with someone is just to agree to disagree, to coexist with that person. And while that sounds like a noble thing to do, that's not always possible. No, and and it's often the worst thing we could possibly do. And and so I have a, a spirit in me. I'm, I actually don't. I don't think I love conflict, even though I'm always in the center of it in the fork. <laughs> I do. People think I I just I seek it out. But what I really want is I want to press in. There comes a point of tension where we often people say, "Okay, well this is too uncomfortable, so I'm going to just stop here." What I want us to do is push past that discomfort to a place of really saying, "Let's dig into this and let's risk." making it worse before it gets better because we have to be able to wrestle with not only what we believe on the surface, but why we believe what we believe. And if someone says to me, hey, I'm really not sure about uh, same-sex marriage. I, I don't understand it because of the way I was raised in my faith. That I can work with. But if someone says, I think someone is morally inferior to me because they're gay, I can't work with that because I need people to respect the other's humanity. At the bottom line, this is what it's about. If I can have a difference of opinion, but still see the humanity in someone and treat them with that regard, then I think we still have work we can do. But the moment we completely dehumanize someone, there's no space for that. And that's where we often have to draw that really uncomfortable line. Yeah, I mean, Republicans often bludgeon liberals with the idea of tolerance. Like if we don't like something, they often say, aren't you supposed to be the tolerant ones? (laughs) And as you've pointed out so well, it's not a requirement to tolerate people who or to tolerate everything equally. We can, we're allowed to have limits. We can be very accepting of multiple worldviews and belief systems and attitudes and social issues while still finding some too much. You know, you point out in your writing that Saying we believe in diversity doesn't mean we accept everything equally and just say, well, we're all different, right? Like, I don't, I'm not like, well, you know, some people are neo-Nazis and it's good. You know, like, I don't, like, that's not, there's just certain beliefs and legislation and movements and people that we can't get down with and we don't gel with them. And our belief in people's humanity doesn't allow that for us. And we don't need to be making excuses for those people. I think it's really important. I mean, you wrote an article back in the spring talking about the war in Ukraine and explaining that supporting a murderous dictator as he kind of like goes in and slaughters people in his neighboring country just because he wants it for himself and doesn't accept them as legal citizens of their own country, that's not a valid position. We don't need to understand it. Taking over another country because you want it isn't on equal footing with protecting your own innocent civilians from an unjustified foreign invasion, right? Vladimir Putin is the bad guy. And Ukrainians are the good guy here. And 
They're not two sides of the same coin and we do ourselves a disservice pretending that they are, right? Choosing to dehumanize people for say their gender identity or their sexual orientation or celebrating legislation that punishes them for being different than you. That's not a valid position and we don't need to pretend it is, right? I think this is where we're at now. There's people that are justifying the insurrection, a violent insurrection because they didn't Mm. like the outcome of an election. And you wrote about that in a lot of your work. Believing white people are better than black people. That's not a valid position and we shouldn't have to argue it like it's a good faith argument. Yeah. And, and you know, there's a story that we all tell ourselves in our heads about who we are, about our own goodness, about our own desire to be decent human beings. And that's the, that's also a difficult part of this because every single human being in their head feels like, well, I'm, my cause is just, my motives are pure and my method is the correct one. And so most people don't intentionally desire to be cruel or hateful or discriminatory. However, they're a product of their story. And so they're living in such a way that that is those things. And so sometimes it's about us leaning into people and saying, hey, can I help you see, uh, you know, I never want to condemn someone purely for the way they vote. I would rather say, can we show you the result of your legislation that you support? Let me show the result of the political movement that you're aligned with. And let me show you the way it's actually impacting humanity, because I do want to give them a chance to let their humanity come to bear on that. Or I want them to be able to evolve. You know, we many people who are listening to this or watching it, they don't believe what they used to believe 10 years ago about same-sex marriage or about birth control or immigration. And so everyone does evolve to one place or another. And that's the hard part is that we want people to see everything at one time and that's not going to happen. So the best we can do is incrementally give them information that might alter their road a little bit. And that's what I want for people. And here's the thing that the conservative Christians and Trump supporters and Republicans don't ever understand. I am not against them. I am for them. You know, I want quality education for my kids and other people's children, but for their children. And I want the, you know, the the planet not to be on fire, not just because it'll make me feel better, but because they'll prosper. Health insurance, the same thing, on and on and on. I, I'm for them and the politicians and the religious leaders who they worship are not. And that's part of this too. Yeah. I often say, if you look at it, like, are we taking things from you or are we giving things to you? And one side keeps taking things away. Yeah. And I think you have to look at it like that. Like voting Republican doesn't make you a bad person, but the Republican positions right now hurt people. And you have to look at what the results of that would be and then ask if that is what you want to be a part of. No, I I think, you know, I think many people don't realize that not only are Republican leaders or conservative Christian leaders taking things from, you know, oppressed peoples, they're taking them away from their own voters and own supporters. And that's what I want. I try to help people understand I'm I'm with you. I mean, you're just a human being living your life. And I want you to see the forces that are at work here that you may not be thinking about. So we, we are truly in it together. Yeah, absolutely. We're in it together. We want you to have the same rights as everyone else. And it should benefit all of us. Uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents, Christians, non-Christians, Muslims, everyone. We should all be, instead of taking, we should be giving and we should be looking out for one another. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, John. I mean, your insight is always so inspiring, but I feel like we really needed your perspective more than ever as we go into this Next year. I mean, before you go, I'd love to speak to the pastor and you about what your thoughts are uh, going into this new and very precarious new year. I guess what I'm reminded of, Lee, is that whatever happens in November, uh, the political result either way is not going to change or fix all of the stuff that we've been talking about, those relational fractures, those fundamental differences are still going to be there. And we're still going to have work to do to figure out how to navigate the future of our nation with people we disagree fundamentally with. And so for the this upcoming year, what I'm doing is trying to 
bring the best of myself to bear on everything that's happening to try to be the most compassionate person I can be, the most courageous person I can be, the clearest in speaking truth without dehumanizing. And I'm going to rest in whatever happens politically, we will then respond. But I want it to be about uh, not the evil of someone else uh, or the the badness of a group of people. It needs to be about my and your goodness. And the more we live into that goodness, the more we're going to see the changes that we're hoping to see outside of politics, outside of theology, and in human lives. So that's what we're that's what I'm going for. That's a pretty good thing to go for, John. I'm going to jump on that train since. Half the thoughts I have these days come from your writing, and I hope people will follow it. I mean, I hope people will do some late holiday shopping, honestly, and pick up your new book worth fighting for. But please tell them the best way to follow you and your work into the new year. Well, fortunately, there are not a, not a lot of John Pavlovitzes around. So once you learn how to spell my last name, you will find me at all the uh, you know regular places. But I would love to just connect with people because it's what I do. It's connecting like-hearted people and trying to live into empathy collectively. So um, I look forward to meeting more of your uh, viewers and listeners. Well, from one like-hearted person to another, happy holidays, my friend. Thank you for joining me. And I hope you'll come back again. Absolutely. You as well. So that was the wonderful John Pavlovitz reminding us to be the best of ourselves this year, to have the hard conversations and be okay risking making it worse before it gets better. As John says, it's not politics or religion that divides us. It's vision. We're in a vision divide. And you might have to detribe before you retribe. Do not live in a conditional community where you have to silence yourself because you fear being ostracized. Seek true like-hearted people and work together for the betterment of all. Isn't that the true reason for the season? I want to thank John for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Happy New Year to you and yours. Let's make this world a better place. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.